Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the show. Lauren, thank you so much for joining me on today's episode. Thank you for having me, Eric. I'm really excited about this conversation. And uh, also, thank you for the opportunity in being here today. Yeah, I'm excited to chat with you. And um, before we recorded, you sent over like just kind of a breakdown of your journey or path. And it's like you crossed every box of like every <laughs> notable person or location. Um, but take take me back to kind of the very beginning. Um, you mentioned that your dad was on staff at the church that you started in the IFBN. Is it safe to assume you don't remember anything prior to being in the IFB and sitting in pews Sunday morning? Yeah, I was pretty much born and raised in the IFB from the time I was weeks old. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I grew up at Gospel Light Baptist Church in Walkertown, uh, North Carolina. And uh, yeah, my dad was on staff at the Span. He was the Spanish pastor um, at Gospel Light. And um, yeah, from the time I was little, every time we had conferences, revivals, um, you know, I went to the Christian school from the time I was three until graduated. Um, we were pretty much there, like, you know, at every single service, every single meeting. Um, I always like joke that it's like, it was my second home, um, like being at the church. So, yeah, yeah I relate to that. I always feel like my time was probably more spent on church property than my own house. <laughs> Cause it was like Monday through Friday at school, Saturday, going out, knocking doors, Sunday in church, like the amount of time is, is immense. Um, for you, like growing up in it, there's no other perspective at that point. So like growing up, did you have a positive outlook at the environment around you? Did you love it? Did it feel like, Oh, is there something besides this? Or were you just kind of like, this is, this is my second home. I love it. And I can't imagine being anywhere else. Yeah. Um, I would say overall, um, I had a really good experience and, um, mostly all positive, um, you know, memories like my parents, um, they, you know, loved us and they took care of us. I had good relationships with my mom and dad. I still have a great relationship with my mom. Um, my dad actually passed away about four and a half years ago. Oh. Um, so he was a Spanish pastor up until he passed away. And, um, so I had, yeah, I had like a really good experience. Um, some of my closest friends, like we all met through gospel light, um, the highlights, highlights of our summers were the youth conferences and camps. Um, so overall I would say it was a great experience, um, looking back, um, like at that time, but then now that I have kind of stepped away from that world, I see a lot of harmful teachings that really affected me throughout, you know, my adulthood and, you know, throughout even like, even as a teenager, um, I see a lot of some teachings that were harmful that I'm looking at now. Yeah. I I definitely want to chat about those, but one thing I don't want to gloss over is you had the experience of being a kid whose parent was in ministry, which is, uh, a totally, I think, different perspective because you're seeing kind of the behind the scenes of of the ministry world, um, but also like just the amount of people you encountered. Like you were around like Jack Treber at conferences. You were around like sort of Lord conferences and all the names associated with that. Um, you know, you mentioned like Ray Young from Hiles. Like there's a, a long list of of people. Like what was your kind of perspective being a staff kid? kind of growing up and seeing all these people come through, like, what was that experience like? Yeah. So it was, it's actually interesting because Gospelite was, um, there were a lot of connections at Gospelite, but they didn't really follow in one specific camp. Yeah. Um, for example, we would have like Jack Trever come to our revivals. Um, we would have, <clears throat> um, like the sword, but we hosted the sword lore conference. So you have people like, um, you know, Shelton Smith, Tony Hudson, like that camp. Um, we even had Greg Locke would, pre- would preach at uh, our youth conferences, which he's, <laughs> yeah, he's crazy. But anyway, yeah. um, so like we had, and Kenny Baldwin would come speak. So we had a lot of different connections, mm-hmm. but Gospite never really fit into like one of those specific like camps. Um, Gospite was a lot more like, it was, it was just different seeing, like it almost seemed like, you know, uh, depending on who would come and speak was like, like, okay, make sure you dress up today or make sure the skirt's like really long or make sure you're not wearing sleeveless. Like, cause gospel didn't really like, they were strict as far as, um, 
like it was definitely IFB, but they didn't get as hung up on like basketball shorts and, no. you know, like girl, like if we wore flip flops, that wasn't a like big deal. And most of like most of the kids in my class, like went to movies and girls wore pants. Like mm-hmm. it was like pretty normal. Um, but when like specific churches or people would come, um, I just remember thinking like, okay, gospel is not too bad because, you know, their standards were like so much more like strict than how we grew up. Um, so it was just, it was interesting seeing all the different types, like Kyle Anderson and first Baptist. That was like a whole different level of yeah. the, the entire church was so different. Cause like at gospel light, our pastor, um, like the main pastor was brother Bobby and he was very down to earth. Um, you know, very much a people person. He, I don't remember him like ever screaming and shouting and like harping on, like what women wore. Um, and I don't like, he was not a very authoritative like person. He was just very down to earth, very like, it was just like an old fashioned country church. Yeah. Um, so a lot of people respected that. Um, but a lot of the churches that would come and speak at were just very different than how we yeah. like the things at gospel light. Yeah. What what was Greg Locke like in his IFB hated? Because that, cause that's one thing, like, I know I know a couple of people who knew him when he was preaching there in that time. And, like, now I look at him now, and he's in his own own camp of his own creation at this point. What was he like then? Because I, I've never seen him fully in that world. I've only seen him, like, post where he's just gotten crazier and crazier as time's gone on. Honestly, it's funny because looking back, like a lot of his like, cause I still like will we'll watch clips of him because like the things he says is so bizarre. And I'm like, yeah. did you really just say that? Um, but a lot of his, like his preaching style is very similar mm-hmm. to like how it was in the IFB. He yeah. just, it was more of like the suit and tie, the KJV only, like the more gospel music hymns. Like he was more like he was in that world. And I remember, um, I think it was like my 11th grade or 12th grade year he um, kind of walked away from the IFB and went yeah. like a little more like contemporary. And I remember we just like never invited him back to gospel. Yeah. Um, yeah. But his style of preaching like always remained the same, except now he's just crazier. Yeah. Um, and it's just so funny and kind of embarrassing because I remember like at that time thinking, Oh, he's like my, one of my favorite preachers. And, and now I'm just like, cring- you know, it's like a little cringy thinking back on that. Yeah. Um, now but, he's like your second or third favorite. He's kind of gone down a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Now he's like, yeah, second or third, <laughs> but um, no, he just, yeah. A lot of his style was, is still very similar, but yeah. um, I just remember like, we were all like so excited because, you know, Greg Locke's preaching tonight, but um, now I'm just like, why? And I think he like signed one of my Bibles. Like, I don't know. Cause that was, you know, everyone was into the yeah. whole signing of Bibles. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, like, you know, I always ask people like, what was your initial experience? And I think for the most part, it's positive for people who start in it. And then it's a question of when's the first time you noticed anything that was like a little bit weird or where you felt like, you know, maybe we wouldn't call it this at the time, but a red flag, you know, so to speak. And, you know, for me, it wasn't, it was literally like 17 or 16 where it's like, oh, there's something wrong here. Um, and I was talking to someone yesterday. It was like, I was eight, you know, so where for you, like, did you have any moments where you were like, this feels off or there's this weirdness that we're switching our style completely when a certain speaker comes, like, was there ever a moment where you were like, something's not quite right here. I can't put my finger on it. Yeah. I would say it was, it was more of a gradual, like little instances. So, um, I was always one to question everything. Mm -hmm. I've never like bought into not like not like my faith in Christianity, but I never bought into like the silly, like no pants and like, we can't go to the movies. Well, why not? And, and one thing I will say is I really admire my dad. Um, um, he always gave me a voice. Like he always let me speak Mm -hmm. my opinion. It was never, I'm the, you know, I'm the dad or I'm the husband of the house and you can't say anything. Um, like he always gave me room to speak, room to ask questions. Um, and even though we never like saw, saw eye to eye on certain things, he did like, we had good conversations about, um, different things that they, you know, this hit, like his influence was more from Hiles, which is where he and my mom mm. met. They actually met at Hiles, got married. And then my dad grew up at Gospelite. So then they came back to Gospelite and, um, 
that, and then that was when he did the Spanish ministry. So a lot of his influence came from Hiles Anderson, but Gosplite was a little more like, like I said, in my class, um, like, which we had, I think I graduated with 42 kids, which is a decent amount for a Christian school. Yeah. Um, I graduated with one other person, so <laughs> that's huge to me. Yeah, yeah. So we had about 40, a little over 40. And, um, you know, most of my other friends, like they all wore pants. They all went to movies. They all listened to other music. You know, they all um, they, like they had like pretty normal lives. And so I think that was kind of the first time I really questioned, like, well, why are like, why are my parents so strict with like, you know, all these little things? And I think that was the first time those are like little moments throughout, like, for example, it was, it was all like me and my dad had a conversation a lot about pants. Cause I just never understood why it was such a big deal. Um, and I just remember, you know, he would use the verse in Deuteronomy 22, five, I think is like the exact verse. Cause we had so many conversations about it. Um, and it was like, you know, a girl sh- or like women shouldn't wear anything that pertained to a man, but it was like, but I was buying basketball shorts in the men's clothing. So yeah. it was just like, like, cause we, so, the, so they were long enough and full enough. Like we would go to the men's clothing to get basketball shorts. And I'm like, well, that doesn't make any sense. No. Um, so I think there are little moments like that. And then when I went to Hiles Anderson, that was where I really like questioned a yeah. lot. Um, cause it was like a whole different world up there than like, it was a gospel light. Right. Well, you mentioned, um, before recording, like the Scott incident happened literally, I think a month before you left for college. Um, so that's 20, that's 2013, right? If I'm um, correct. 2012. 2012. Yeah. I, I remember it being near the end of my no. high school time, but I can never remember if it's Actually, it might be 2000 because I graduated. No, it was 2012 because I graduated. That was the year I graduated May 12 or May 2012. Hmm. And um, if I remember, maybe my brain is like remembering differently, but it was. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was 2012. And um, it was I remember like it happened towards the end of the summer. And this it was like three weeks before I was supposed to go to Howells Anderson. Um, like had everything ready to go, had bought all of these things, you know, cause I had to buy like a whole new ward, ward, wardrobe, you know, for, because that fit their aesthetic and rules. Yeah, and, it, was, yeah. it was a totally different. Yeah. Um, and I remember my dad was like super down, you know, there was one, um, afternoon where he was really sad and I could tell something was really bothering him. And, um, I wouldn't say that he idolized Jack Scott. But he definitely had a lot of influence. There was a lot of influence, like at Hiles Anderson and between yeah. like Scott, Jack Hiles. Um, and then I remember him telling me like what happened um, with Jack Scott. And I just remember thinking like, what am I supposed to do now? Like, do I still go? Do yeah. I not go? And so, yeah, like I, I still ended up deciding to go because I didn't really feel like I had another option. Like we had mm-hmm. already, you know, spent all this money and I was supposed to do the Jericho program, which was a complete disaster. Um, The Jericho program was, if you, I'm trying to remember, was that if you did three years, you got a a year free or something, or there was some kind of weird deal? Yeah. So it, so the Jericho program was, so I think that one is Pensacola. If you do like three years, you get the last year. I think they all have some weird deal like that because they know you're going to stay for four, but yeah. Uh, but it's very similar. I believe if I remember correctly, it was, you paid like one deposit at the beginning of the year or beginning of the semester. And then I think you paid for your books, but then your first two years, you basically got for free, free, but you were working on the campus. Gotcha. Um, so like the, my, my first two years, I had to work like 20 hours. I think it was like 20 hours a week. And that was going towards my tu- tuition, but it was like paid for essentially. Gotcha. Um, but if you did not graduate, you had to pay all this money back. So that was where they got you. Mm. Um, because if I like it, you know, and people, a lot of people left that year because the original contract was signed by Jack Scott. And so when that and he's not happened, fulfilling it now, yeah. Right. Right. So they had to like revamp the contract and they made like, that was like, I remember like the first week of college, if not the first day, we all had to like resign the contract again. Mm. Um, and yeah, basically, and then the last, I think the last two years you had to pay like in full, like, you know, each month. 
So the junior program was like the first two years you just like worked on campus. Right. And then, um, yeah. So. Yeah. What was the, I understand not feeling like you have a choice because like you're already locked in, you know, for this, but I'm curious what your, I mean, it, it just, I have to imagine it's, it's confusing because you're seeing like a leader who's like obviously revered by people in your immediate circle, um, including like family. There's this situation that happens and then like, oh, I'm starting college, which is a big shift anyway. Like, what were you feeling like showing up on campus going like, I don't even know how to process this. And now I have to like start this whole new chapter of life. Yeah, it was definitely a weird feeling because I, I honestly like never really wanted to go to Howell Sanderson. That was not my top, you know, choice in college. But, um, and my parents never forced me to go. Like they never said like, you have to go. Um, but I felt like I didn't have another option because when I would bring up other colleges, it was kind of shot down as like, well, we can't really afford you to send you there. If you go there, you have to pay for it. Right. And I, was like, I have no money. <laughs> so, um, and, and then like the whole thing was the Jericho program. Cause that was like, I think that was like a newer program that they were yeah. doing. And so that was like my way of being able to afford to go to college. Um, whereas now, you know, I look back and think there's, I did have options. I just didn't know I had those options. Um, so, and then when I got on campus, it was, it was really strange because it, at least from my perspective, it was like, um, it was almost as if he had never like existed there. Hmm. Like if he was not referenced at all, um, like any kind of pictures that were up from him, like were taken down. We never read any of his books in the school. Um, People never talked about it. Like it just, no one talked about it unless like there were like, if you were like in an inner circle, like I remember some people were like, oh, well, you know, he was on a lot of medication. So Mm -hmm. he was in his right mind and they were kind of excusing like, and they mentioned things about the, the girl or whatever. And I just remember thinking like, but he was the pastor, like he was the leadership, like it doesn't matter, you know, if he was on medication or whatever it like, he chose, like he did that, like he abused that girl. And, you know, I just remember that people, I don't know. It was just a weird atmosphere. It was, it was almost like he just like, didn't, didn't exist. No. It was it was strange. No. D- did you end up doing your full time there? Um, I did actually, I don't know how I honestly graduated and did get kicked out not because of anything like crazy, but just, they were like, they looked for things. Yeah. They, it was like, they wanted you to be in trouble. Um, and so I actually, I ended up graduating, but I did it in three years because I was so ready to get out. Um, and so my last year I did, um, like all my classes in person. And then I just like crammed all these online classes Mm. throughout the summer, throughout my last year, um, and graduated in 2015. Okay. So, um, and there was, I was also at that time I was engaged, um, to a guy who he went to house at one point, but he was not there at the time. So we were dating long distance. And so I was just ready to get out, wanted to get married, like all that stuff. Um, but it just like, I don't know, like how's Anderson, it like, it was just like night and day compared to gospel and how's Anderson. It just, it was a whole different world. I honestly like, thanked my parents when I came home. I was like, wow, y'all were like not actually that strict. Yeah, um, right. And I remember having like more freedom as a high schooler, you know, at gospel light than I did as a college student because they just monitored like everything you did all the time. Yeah. Um, so it was, yeah, it was definitely somehow I made it through. I don't know. I really like looking back now, I have no idea how I like, went there and survived. <laughs> well, congratulations. You made it. Um, <laughs> yeah. So did you have a plan as far as like what you wanted to do post college? And you mentioned like wanting to get married and did you have like career plans aside from getting married? <laughs> was that, was that the career plan? Cause I know at um, the reason I ask is I know at Hiles, like that's kind of the classes is like how to be a wife. Yeah. <laughs> like uh, what was, what was kind of the the path you had envisioned while going to college? Well, that, that is kind of the joke because it was like, you stay there until you get your MRS degree. Mm-hmm. And like, that was the joke. Like, and I remember thinking like, 
it was really difficult because I went in thinking like, okay, this is where I'm supposed to go. Even though I didn't really want to go there, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. Um, and then I ended up like, you know, meeting a guy, um, through his sister, we like connected and then I'm like, okay, I'm getting married now and I'm graduating. Like I checked all these boxes of what I'm supposed to do. And then like three weeks before or three weeks after we got, I graduated, we ended up like breaking up engagement was called off and it like, I was like, what am I supposed to do now? Because I mean, I changed my mind like so many times going, like we only had a few options. It was basically, you know, a, a teacher, a secretary and music. It were like pretty much the options. And, you know, at first I thought I wanted to be a teacher and realized that's not like the path for me. Um, but I just remember like it, there were, there was so much of an emphasis on like how like our classes were how to cook yeah. and like how, like a sewing class. And it was just, it was preparation in like being a wife and a mother, which is not a bad thing, but like, right. Yeah. I just, there weren't many options. Like, yeah. 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 None of them are bad. If it's an option, if it's the only option, it's, it becomes a little tricky. Um, you mentioned like going, returning home, going back to gospel light, which is like a breath of fresh air. Like, mm -hmm. and it's always funny because I always describe to people, like I had the best of a bad situation where it's like in this very weird, strict culty ish environment in a lot of ways. And then, you know, but my parents had very open dialogue, like had a good relationship. Like there were a lot of things that are positive that I still look at as positive. Um, and it, it begs the question from people who are in it, like, if things weren't that bad, why is there more to this story? Like, why keep questioning? Why keep, you know, pushing back on some of these things? Like, if it's not hurting you necessarily, you know, why keep questioning? Like, what kept prompting questions from you returning back from college, like, sitting in the pews, like, hanging out with people from the church? Like, what kept sparking these kind of questions and conversations? Yeah. So, um, so yeah, when I left, um, you know, I graduated and we, I ended up breaking, we broke up, um, that I was engaged to, uh, which was really devastating because, you know, I, my plan was, like, he lived in California. So the plan was to move to California, like find a job, you know, like whatever. And I was looking forward to that. And then it was all just like gone. Like I had to move back home and with my parents, I have a degree that I literally can't do anything with. Um, I have no job. I'm not dating anyone. Um, and so I, you know, I just like, went back to Gosswhite, found a job like in the area. Uh, I think I babysat for a while and cleaned some houses. And um, it just, it, I honestly, that was probably the lowest point in my life mm -hmm. because I did everything I was supposed to do and it completely backfired on me. And I started questioning my self-worth. I started questioning um, my faith. I started questioning like just everything that I had been taught as far as, um, well, you know, like what is my purpose here? Like I, like when we broke up, it was like, well, now what am I supposed to do? And going back to gospel, I, it was just kind of like, for a long time, I was just there, like going through the motions. There was not any heart in it. I became very apathetic uh, towards like anything, like never cried, never had emotions. Nothing bothered me. I made some very poor decisions. Um, and I think I just, I think because like a combination of like so much that I saw at Hiles Anderson with like, there was just so much fakeness and hypocrisy. No. I get that people are human and they mess up and they make mistakes. But like, it's one thing to like make a genuine mistake and to get up and say one thing and you're living a completely double life. Right. And I just saw so much of that and it just began to make me question everything. Um, right. And then there was a situation back when I like came back to gospel, like, cause I came back in 2015 and then about a year later um, and I've kind of went back and forth on like, do I want to disclose this? Do I want to not say anything? But I really feel like I should because um, it's a part of my story. And also I feel like if it's going to help someone else, then it's worth um, like speaking up about. Um, so there was, there was a guy that uh, went to gospel with, a, with all of us and he was 
you know, like we all saw each other all the time. And at one point we were like all good friends. Um, but like we started noticing that he was pretty fake. Like he would say one thing, do something completely different. He was mm. very manipulative and we just didn't really know if we could like trust this guy. Um, and he was about the same age as us. And I remember we like the friendship, it was kind of like back and forth. Sometimes we, you know, saw each other at church and we would be friendly and nice. And then other times he would do something. I'm like, I'm never speaking to you again. Um, and you know, that kind of went on for a little bit. Well, then all of a sudden he decided that he was going to, um, go to crown to be a youth pastor and he was going to turn over this new leaf and, you know, be a great person. And we were all trying to like give him the benefit of the doubt. Okay. Maybe he has changed. Maybe he's, you know, a good person now. And, um, there was one summer in specific that, um, he, and he had like, there had been times prior, like, you know, prior to the situation where he had tried to do things and it made me feel very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And I'd asked him to please stop. Um, and so I, that's why, why a lot of the time I avoided him when I could. Um, and so whenever he, you know, started, you know, talking about being a youth pastor and going to crown and we all started like hanging out again. And he like asked me, asked to hang out one day. And at first I, you know, didn't really want to hang out with him because, you know, I just didn't know like what his intentions were. And so I told him like, okay, like, sure. Like I eventually said yes, but I, you know, don't try anything. I don't want to do anything physical, like, you know, and long story short, I don't need to get into all the details, but he basically disregarded everything that I said and like, just like took advantage of me. And, um, I walked away from that situation feeling like just like disgusting and like a piece of meat. I felt, um, like my voice didn't matter. Cause I told him like, I did not want to do that. And, um, I just felt, and I blame myself. Like yeah. I never, like in that moment, I never like blamed him or anything. It was just like, well, I shouldn't have went, I should have done that. I should have done more. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I just like kind of kept it to myself for a good while and didn't really say anything. But throughout this entire time, I'm like questioning my faith, like, you know, because everything I was told was, you know, because like your parents tell you and because the pastor tells you and because the college tells you, but I was at the point where I was like, I need to like figure out what I believe for, for me. And, um, so I went through like a year of just like trying to figure all that out. And it wasn't until probably about a year later when I remember very vividly, I was watching a TV show and there was a very similar situation that happened on the show where the girl was, um, she was raped and I, it like felt like it felt so personal. And I remember sitting there like, why is this affecting? Like, and I, it was the first time I was like really triggered and I didn't know why, like, like why I was having all these weird feelings of like, yeah. it felt very um, like similar and familiar. And I remember thinking like that happened to me. Like it, it like clicked for the first time in my head mm -hmm. that like that situation had happened to me. And, but I still like blame myself, even though like right. I've, it finally clicked like, Oh, that happened. But it was still like, well, it's my fault. And I still should have never went. I still, you know, I still kept blaming myself and I still like kept it in for a long time. Didn't tell anybody. Um, and then about probably a year later, uh, I remember I was getting my hair done and my hairdresser. It, I've known him since I was in camp. Like we've known, I've known him forever. Oh, I'm so yeah. sorry. My system just went away. No, can you I can okay. see you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Something, my computer is really weird. Um, so I remember sitting there and, um, he's always been like very honest, very open with me. And I remember like just telling him about the, like the whole situation mm. went into detail and he, I just, I remember saying like, Oh my gosh, like I've never said that out loud before. It's like the first time I've ever told anyone. And I remember still saying, but it was my fault. Like I should have said, no, I should have went. And I mean, I did, I did say no, but I didn't say no to like hanging out with him. And, um, I remember him telling me that like, no, like you voiced that you did not want that. It is not your fault. What happened to you? And I remember that was like the first time in my life that I felt validated. Mm -hmm. And I felt like, 
like, like I just felt like it, like it all just clicked. It was like, you know, I just like had carried so much guilt and shame from the situation that I had blamed myself. But like, I did tell him, no, I did say, I do not want to do this. And he like completely disregarded everything that I said. And, um, that was the first time that like, I just felt seen. And, um, and then I believe like, and then that, and then I kind of opened up to some other people, like really close friends. Um, and you know, interesting enough, like there were other similar situations that had happened with other people. Um, cause like, I know like I wasn't the only one that this happened to, Um, and you know, it just, it just made me like question, like, you know, I, like, if this is the kind of world that these people continue to get by with do, cause he like to this day, I mean, he's out living his life, doing his own thing. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, people, and I actually like just told my mom recently, um, like, you know, hadn't, I didn't really tell her cause I didn't want to hurt her. I knew it would, Mm -hmm. it would have devastated her. Um, And I just remember people asking, like, why didn't you say something when it happened? And I just blame myself. Like, I didn't see it. And, like, I just, you know, it wasn't something that I didn't realize what had happened until years later. Um, And then, you know, when you hear all these stories, um, you know, people that you know, like, I was, I went to college with Rachel and hearing her story, um, it just, it, I just didn't want anything to do with that kind of world anymore. Yeah. And I think that was like my breaking point was I just like, and, and, and even though like to my knowledge, nothing like that ever happened at gospel light, um, there were still too many connections for me to stay. And, um, like, I mean, I'm sure you're familiar with the Cedric McCormick story. Like, you know, um, that was another thing. I just, just seeing people get up there in church and claim that they're like, you know, this person and they're support me and give me money and and whatever. And it's like, you're a terrible person. And like, I just don't understand how you can sit there and support a church that like, doesn't stand for abuse. Yeah. Um, so I think that was like my fine, like, and then, yeah, just like all the stories I just like, there are just too many connections. I'm like, you have to sit there and think like, okay, why is this happening? there's obviously a common denominator here. Yeah. And um, I don't know if I actually mentioned this whenever I reached out to you, um, but another really crazy connection um, is, so I don't remember a few years, I think it was like two years ago, there was a Spanish pastor in Greensboro, Albert Lopez, mm-hmm. that was arrested. Um, So my dad was actually roommates with him at House oh, wow. Yeah. And so that's actually how my dad learned Spanish. So Albert didn't know a lot of English. My dad didn't know a lot of Spanish and he was really curious and learning. Um, they were roommates. They kind of like both taught each other the different languages. And um, when my dad moved back here to Winston, he started a church in Greensboro. So I remember like seeing, um, you know, that story. Yeah. And I, I don't know. It's just like, there's just so many, it just like, not like when I read like the headlines and and saw like what had happened and just, like my heart just like also it's saying, but I was also like just pissed off that these things just keep happening. Yeah. And to me, like the common denom- denominator is Howells Anderson and first Baptist. And it's like, why are there so many people yeah. that come out of that church? Like you have to, you have to start questioning, like there's a common denominator here and there's obviously yeah. found a fundamental reason why this keeps happening. Yeah. And it just, I just wanted to walk away from all of that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's that's one of the big things cuz like I think one of the responses always is like what about the good, you know, churches or and and I I think that there's valid perspective there in the sense of I think especially with what I do like and I think for people who maybe listen to what I do like it's easy to become cynical (laughs) and um, it's easy to go, Oh, it's everybody. And every under every rug, there is something hidden, you know? And at the end of the day, there are good people. There's good churches. There's people that would never stand for any of this, but like you said, at a certain point, it's like how many connections do there need to be before we start going like, there's something wrong here. Like the orbit of Hiles Anderson is so polluted, you know? And, you get around, I mean, just the names that you mentioned being around, like 
everybody from Treber to Cedric, you know, McCormick and, you know, Greg Locke in totally different weird areas. Like there's, there's weird scandals and connections to all of those. And it's like, okay, we might be the good ministry, but it's like, why are we around all these other super negative and horrific, you know, ministries and people? Um, and it's, it's hard to reconcile that. Like that's still, it's still hard for me. I have people, I still am like, oh, they're one of the good ones, but I'm like, but their orbit is so weird. <laughs> like the people that are around is so, so bizarre. Um, for you, like there's questioning, like the ministry, you mentioned questioning your faith um, a little bit. Like, what does that mean for you now? Like, where has that, is it now like, oh, I just, I don't associate with that denomination, but I still maintain my faith. Is it something where it's like, that's a conversation? Is it something where it's like a totally, like, did you convert to (laughs) a different religion? Like where, where are you at now on that, that kind of journey? I'm curious. Yeah. So, um, my faith was something that definitely was questioned and, you know, even at certain times in my life was wavered. Um, but throughout most of my life, there was, I was able to kind of distinguish like, okay, that like had nothing, like God was not, did not approve of that. God didn't, would, did not, would not stand for that. Um, and so there was a, there were certain times where I kind of was able to determine like, that's just, you know, not a great church. And those are not great men, uh, or people. And, um, but like, God did not approve of that and God would not have been for that. Um, so even though like there were times where my faith was definitely questioned, especially when my dad got sick, Mm. uh, with, with lung cancer, like I questioned a lot of things. Um, but at the end of the day, I think, one thing that really helped me was re- like rereading the Bible um, from like in chronological order from the very beginning and like just walking through the actual context of like wh- how the Bible was written, the culture that it was written in, going back to like the Greek and Hebrew. I think by me, like kind of, and I wouldn't say like deconstructing, but just re questioning everything that had been taught. Yeah. Um, that was really helpful because I was able to disassociate like the negative things and the bad things from not being of God, but of just being from like really just bad people. And I think there are churches that um, definitely are like the found from the foundation of that church. It's not a, it's just not a good yeah. environment. It's not, there's not good people. And then I've met some like good churches that, um, you know, I think that they, they would absolutely stand for abuse. And, that was the one thing like looking back, cause I wish I was able to have a lot of these conversations with my dad now, because yeah. when your podcast came out, he had already passed away. And I just remember as a kid, you know, he would always tell us that, you know, I am a mandated reporter. If anything ever came up, like I would like, you know, I would report that if there was any suspicion of a child or someone being harmed, like he was a huge advocate for that. Um, which is just like, how did you, how are you so good? Even though, when I was Anderson. Um, but it was encouraging because I feel like if something like that were to happen in the Spanish ministry, then my dad would have stood up and not had, you know, um, he would not have just shoved it under the rug or, um, kept quiet about it. Like he would have taken it to the authority and not the pastor, like the, like police, like the law enforcement. Um, and so like that to me, like there were just like little signs throughout my life where I still, um, like held on to my faith and I still do. Um, I, um, I don't trust people very easily. It takes me a long time to like build that trust. And even then, like, even though now we, we have found a good church that, um, is, um, it, I feel like it truly is like, it, it, there's, there's really no connections. So it's just like the church, um, and which is really encouraging. And, um, you know, I asked a ton of questions before we joined. Like we visited for a whole year before we decided to join. Yeah. Um, you know, they are they protect the children. Like I had to go through a background check. Um, it, even if you're just help like volunteering in VBS, like you still have to do go through a background check, do a sexual abuse training. Mm. Um, there's cameras in every room. No, no kid can be alone at all with an adult. Like they are proactively taking steps to ensure the safety of children. And I do feel like if something were to happen, they would handle it in the correct way. Right. Um, So that seeing those little things has been encouraging and that 
well, maybe like not all churches are bad and not all people are bad and pastors yeah. are bad. And, and then just experiencing like, um, like my experience with my faith in general, just like there are things that throughout my life I saw like God's hand in and yeah. like, you know, with my dad's passing and just like how, like, I'm just so thankful that the life that I thought I wanted, like getting married back in college, like I'm so glad that that didn't work out. And just like where I was, like where I am now, um, you know, I just, yeah, it's just, it's, I sometimes think like wonder if I'm even like the same person because I feel like I'm just very, like, I don't know, like people, um, like boundaries were something that, we're just never really talked about. Um, and that's something that I'm trying to implement now. Like it's okay to say no, if you don't want to do something and right. it's okay to, you know, like I just, there's a lot of like just relearning. Um, but I will say like throughout my entire life, my faith has been something that as a whole, I've been able to, um, you know, I've, I've, I've kept my faith, I guess, in a sense, but there were definitely times where that was questioned and, I re kind of, I had to relearn a lot of um, the things that were taught. Yeah. Yeah. That's huge. And I, I was curious to, to know, cause I've talked to people from all varieties of answer on that, like, and, and where they find themselves now. And um, I, I guess kind of my, one thing that I keep thinking about and I'm curious about, cause you mentioned there's a lot of think, ways that your life could have ended up. You know, you just mentioned like if you'd gotten married in college to, whoever it was in college and with the mindset you had in college, like life would have looked very different and um, you know, potentially, I mean, it sounds like definitely wouldn't have been the life that you have now that you like and are excited about and, and are talking about, um, you know, if you could go back and you could change, I don't think I've ever asked anybody this question. If you could go back and change and be like, okay, I never was part of this. I totally just got, fresh slate and I get to start outside of this world. Would you do that? Or do you appreciate the perspective you've gotten from being in it? I don't think I've ever asked anybody. So that's, I think that's the first time I've ever, I've ever asked that question. Yeah. Um, that's a great question. And something that I like wonder every day, mm -hmm. because obviously I feel like if I, if I were to say, Oh, I wish I would have never went to Hollis Anderson College. I don't know if I would be sitting here married to a great man who loves and supports me. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, but I also like, like, it's just, a, it is a part of my story, like every mm -hmm. little bit of it. Um, but at the same time, there are moments where I really do look back and say, if I could do it all again, I don't think I would have went to Hollis Anderson at all. I think yeah. I would. Um, it just like that entire experience was very, I don't, there, I mean, sure. There's some good memories and I met some great people that I still keep in contact with, but as a whole, it really just was not a great experience. And, um, like I, but it's hard to say, like, yeah. you know, it's, it's, there are times where I do wonder like what I would have done if I could go back. And, you know, part of me feels like I wouldn't have never went there. But then I'm like, well, but would that mean that I don't have the life I have now? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, I've never even thought about it for myself until now. So like, I don't even know what, how I would answer the question. Um, Cause it, it is like, it's hard knowing, like, there's a lot of like, for lack of a better word, like wisdom, I feel like that's come out of that background. And you mentioned like, you're, you're a little bit slower to trust, which I think is not a bad quality. Like there's, there's a lot of pieces that are like positive traits I see in myself now. And you see in yourself now where it's like, I wouldn't have those had I not been through <laughs> some weird situations. Um, obviously some it's like, can we get the lesson without the lesson kind of thing? Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm, I really appreciate you sharing and I, I appreciate um, like you kind of walking through this and and talking about this and honestly like one of the things that's just nice is like people who still identify as christian or still have faith um like when they're willing to share and um and be supportive of the stuff that i'm doing is is really encouraging um because it's you know that's something like even now it's like there's a lot of people who claim faith who are like really upset <laughs> at what i'm doing um and I'm just always encouraged, like as a side note, I'm always encouraged, like 
when people understand or see like I'm not trying to attack and destroy like every, every Christian or church or or ministry like that's not the goal. So um, I just want to make sure I said that like I appreciate that um, support and it's super encouraging to me. Yeah, and I've never like thought of you as someone who is like deliberately trying to destroy like Christianity or like Christians in general. It, it I'm it's honestly confusing. I'm like, why do we not talk about it? Like, yeah. why are people so upset that you're speaking out against something that is, you know, needs to be changed? Because yeah. you don't, if we don't talk about it, then it just continues to happen. What do, what do you think that reasoning is? Cause I, cause it's even people, you know, like I, I, sometimes I'll talk to people who are like just very casual, like evangelicals about what I do, who don't have any context for it. And like, sometimes even with them, there's this like, oh, you know, like, like, I never know what their response gonna be when someone asks, like, what's your podcast about? And I'm like, okay, uh, let me tell this Uber driver, you know, what this is. Um, You know, why do you think there is a hesitancy at large to talk about these things? Is it just because it's a difficult conversation? Do you think it's like, do you think it's like legitimate fear? Like, oh, this makes us look bad. So like, let's not talk. Like, why do you think at large, there seems to be like a reticence of talking about these things, even if the people who are reticent to talk about it aren't complicit in it? Right. Um, I think it's a combination of things. I will definitely think that it has a lot to do with the image, um, which is kind of like a lot of what was ingrained in me. It was like, yeah a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. And um, it's okay if you do that, just don't post about it. Or, um, you know, like kind of like this double mindset and that, yes, that was really terrible, but we don't want to tell anybody because then other people, like it'll, like, I think as people always say, like it'll hurt the cause of Christ or Mm -hmm. the name of Christ. And I'm like, no, actually by you handling the situation as the Bible says to, that actually is being more biblical than, not you kinda, know kind of helps <laughs> kind of helps the reputation a little bit right so i think it's a combination of you know people just not wanting to air the dirty laundry and you know not hurting the cause of christ i think that's why but i think that it's really important because otherwise that's why there are so many stories and why it keeps happening because it's not talked about in a healthy way yeah yeah well we've Covered a lot of ground. I'm going to ask you a question I haven't asked in a while on the show, but I'm curious to know your perspective. As someone who's distanced themselves from the IFB, do you think that there is hope for change within the independent fundamental Baptist movement? Um, or do you think it's a movement that is kind of now from the ground up messed up and needs some other version of it to exist? You know, I, because I know you've asked that, like, I've listened to like every podcast. I used to ask it every episode and then just, I just stopped and then, uh, but I'm curious to know your your perspective. Yeah, I I honestly think it depends on the church. I think that Hmm. if that specific church has a really bad foundation where the pastor is very authoritative in that they get up and like, I'm the man of the God and what I do. Like, I think any church that has that mindset needs to just, I I don't think there's any hope for those kind of churches Uh, because there is no accountability. There is no room to grow and learn. It's just, if you have someone that is in power, who is manipulative, narcissistic, authoritative. And I just don't think those kinds of churches, even if it's not an IFB church, but like, I think there, there's not a lot of hope for that kind of church. Um, I think that there are churches where um, there's a lot of change that needs to happen. But I think that because of um, maybe like the pastor, like maybe his personality or, um, you know, like he really does stand against abuse. Um, For example, like I have seen, even though I no longer go to gospel, I I have seen some positive changes, Mm -hmm. um, you know, now, like in order to help out the church, like you have to go through a background, background check and they've been securing a lot of the, um, like the doors at the campuses to make sure like people aren't just taking, like you have to like mat, like have a sticker that matches mm-hmm. the child, um, making sure that not just anyone can come pick up a kid, um, and, and then installing cameras. So I think like there have been some positive changes, um, that I've seen in churches. So I think it really just depends on the church and who the pastor is really. 
Yeah. Well, thank you so much for answering that. Before I let you go, is there anything that we didn't talk about or that you didn't get to say that you want to make sure you say uh, before we wrap up? Oh, gosh. Um, no like no the- pressure. It could be the most but, insightful, powerful thing of all time. But um, uh, I, I think the biggest thing is like, you know, just from my experience, like if if there is anyone out there who has a similar story um, where, you know, I know a lot of the stories you cover is abuse within like the authorities, like the pastors, youth pastors. And a lot of these are children and teens, which is absolutely like, I can't even like, that's, it's just horrific. I can't imagine doing that to a child. Like it just yeah. doesn't even make sense in my head. Um, and while that's not specifically my story, um, I think there's a lot of times where, because we're taught from such a young age to dress a certain way and, and mm. like everything that we put on is um, basically for like, so we don't like make a guy stumble. Like that was yeah. pretty much what was like, you know, I feel like a lot of the teaching was there was so much emphasis on like yeah. what women wore and it made me look at men as like every man was looking at me for my body mm-hmm. or um, it, and it also had gave me a distorted view on women that like if a woman wore something that I, you know, was like a little more revealing, it was like, oh, she's not a good person. So I had like a very distorted view no. um, based on like that teaching and um, and also just like doesn't help your self-esteem and your like value as a woman. And so I would just say that any if there is anyone that has experienced like those feelings of guilt because of a bad situation that they've been in, like it isn't your fault. Like if you specifically say like you do not want this and that there is not that consensual um, conversation, then that is not your fault. And, um, you know, like don't blame yourself. And, and for me, like therapy was really helpful. Um, your podcast was very helpful. Um, you know, those were two very, um, influential things during that time. Like I just, you know, I never felt, I didn't feel alone. And that's yeah. kind of like why I decided to go on here and share my story because, um, I think it is easy to feel isolated and alone in your experience. Um, but you know, you're not alone and yeah. there are a lot of people that can, that relate to, um, this upbringing. Whereas for a long, long time, I felt very alone. Yeah. That. yeah, it's I just interviewed um John Snow yesterday, whose episode will drop some sometime around this. Um, but that's one of the things we talked about. And he talked about like you're not alone. And we're talking about the um we're talking in regards to child sexual abuse, um and talking about the stat of like one in four girls, I think it's one in six boys. And one of the things that I said was like it's probably not one in six. It's probably more because a lot of guys don't report. And then he said, you know, it's probably more than one in four (laughs) for both. And he said, but it's, it's years and years before reporting. There's tons of people with stigma around it that don't want to talk about it. Cause like culturally there's stigma religious, you know, religiously speaking, there's huge stigma. And I think that's what's valuable, like at the very core and essence of the show and of people sharing their stories. It's like, it's a big beacon going, you're not alone. This is my story. If you relate to it in some way, like there's somewhat, there's at least one other person that relates to it. And so um, I appreciate you sharing it and and coming on. I know it's been a long time coming and a lot of time thinking about it. So I appreciate making the decision to do it because I know it's not an easy one. Well, I appreciate you for having me. Uh, I wasn't sure what that process was as far as like sharing my story, but uh, I do appreciate you taking the time and listening.